My dad, Reverend A.D. King, was the youngest of three children born to Martin Luther King Sr. and his wife, Alberta Williams King. Daddy believed in peace and nonviolence, but he was there to stand with his brother through the Civil Rights Movement. I actually saw them love. I actually saw them forgive. I have some very sad news for all of you. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. My as children, we were not allowed to, to have bitterness take root in our heart. And uh, I remember when my uncle was shot, I wanted to hate white people. Somebody was at fault for killing my uncle. And daddy said to me, you can't hate white people. White people did not kill my brother. White people march with us, pray with us, live with us, and die with us. And so it's the devil that killed your uncle. And I really remember that. And he quoted Acts 17, 26, of one blood, God made all people to live together. So we're not even separate races. We're the human race. If we are not trusting, believing, praying to God, not humans, to resolve every issue, every concern, then it won't work. It's going to be very important to follow the commandment of Jesus Christ that takes care of every other commandment, and that's to love. Discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. Love your enemies. Man, I love that quote. Uh, I have decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. Now, friends, you know, we're in a season where it seems like every time we turn on the media, we hear foolishness and folly and falsehood. And I am so thankful to finally get to hear somebody speak with some godly wisdom out of the midst of a terrible time of trial. Now, I actually got a chance to meet Miss Alveda King here in Savannah a few years ago. She told a moving story about how her mother intended to abort her, and her grandfather insisted that her mom love her instead of harming her. And man, she is here today making a difference in our world because her grandfather led her mother to put love first. And can I just say how thankful I am that on this week, you know, I'm thankful for every compassion Christian who continues that godly tradition of putting love first. You know, love over politics, uh, love over racism, love over hate. And you know, Dr. King prayed for a time when little black boys and girls would be holding hands with little white boys and girls. And friends, that prayer is answered in our children's ministry every week, and I thank God for that. But I'm telling you, we still have a long way to grow. So in a country that is just torn by distrust and division and by suspicion and hate and insensitivity and unforgiveness, I'm thankful that our church is trying to lead the way by loving our neighbors, all of our neighbors, as Jesus commanded, whether we look the same or not, whether we agree on everything or not. And friends, we still have a lot, of, lot to learn, but I'm praying that we will learn and that we will grow and man, our love for each other and our respect for everybody will be like a light in the darkness in a country and a culture that has just lost its way. Now friends, you gotta know followers of Jesus were born for times like this. And as we begin our message on how to pray for help, man, let's actually pray that God will help us to love the way he does and be a light for a lost world as we do. Let's pray together. Father, we just wanna thank you that Lord, our church looks more like heaven every week. We're thankful, Lord, that just like in heaven, there are people of every race, every nation, every language, every ethnicity in our church every time we gather. And Father, this is your will. This is how you desire it to be. This is how it will be in heaven. And I pray, God, it will become more and more like heaven here at Compassion every week. Father, we love you and thank you and pray, God, that your love in us will make such a difference in our world that our, our, our church will be like a light, like a city set on a hill and that people will see it and be drawn to you because you are making such a big difference in us. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen, amen, amen. All right, let me welcome everybody who's worshiping with us at all of our campuses today, uh, whether you're at Statesboro or Effingham or Midway or downtown or East or here in the room here at Henderson. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody at Compassion Online who's with us as well. 
You know, my son Cam told me that he and his, son, his family watched our services last Sunday on the way to Nashville as we launched our Rooted series with that first message on, you know, being deeply rooted in prayer. And then when they stopped for lunch, the kids used the baseball diamond prayer plan that I shared when they went to bless the meal. And dude, I like immediate, immediate application. Amen? Amen. Immediate application. Now, friends, uh, today we're going to drill down into the spiritual discipline of prayer one more time. But this time, we're going to talk about praying for help. Now, if there was ever a time when American Christians needed to know how to pray for help, brother, this is it. The inauguration is next Wednesday. What an embarrassing national disaster last Wednesday. Tensions are sky high. Our nation desperately needs believers to model civility and humility and unity and charity. And I'm pretty sure we're going to need the help of God to get that job done. So open your Bible with me to 2 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to see how that works, all right? 2 Kings chapter 18, if you don't see it in your Bible, it's because you've never been there before. The pages are probably sticking together, so look for the clean pages, all right? Uh, or just go to the 10th book in, in the Bible, and that'll be 2 Kings. Uh, and friends, we're going to look at a story that actually inspired me to pray and has trained me to pray, especially in crisis mode, because that's what this story is all about. Now, our story starts when a young man named Hezekiah is 25 years old, and he is crowned the king of Israel. And he is a godly young buck. He was mentored by the prophet Isaiah. Man, he grew to love God and honor God, even though he grew up in a super dysfunctional family, and his daddy was evil. It's, it's an amazing story. But look at how it starts in verse 13. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified stories of cities of Judah and captured them. Now, friends, in the 14th year of his reign, Hezekiah is faced with an impossible situation. Uh, Sennacherib is the king of Assyria, which was one of the superpowers of that day. And he just started sweeping through the Middle East, man, conquering country after country, city after city, until he got to Jerusalem, where the Jewish temple was, which is one of the seven, ancient wonder, seven wonders of the ancient world. And Hezekiah was the king, and his job was to steward that city and protect God's people. Now, Sennacherib sent his field commander to Hezekiah saying, if you don't immediately and unconditionally surrender, we are going to gut every man, woman, and child in Israel uh, and, and just so that everybody in the region will know to play ball. And man, when that messenger left, he left a personal letter for King Hezekiah from King Sennacherib that basically said, dude, don't even think your God can protect you. Don't pray, it won't do any good. Nobody else's God's are protected them. Your God will not protect you. You got 24 hours to surrender or we're going to burn this city to the ground. Now, Hezekiah was 39 years old, but he realized that megalomaniac had the troop strength to do what he was actually threatening to do. And so he realizes, man, my only hope is in God. Dude, if God doesn't show up, it's going to be a massacre, period. I don't have a plan B. I don't know how to come up with one. Either God steps in or it's lights out for me and everybody I love. Now, let's just hit pause here for a second. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever received terrible, terrible news like that? I mean, have you had your life just rocked, you know, by a medical report? Now, we had one of our pastors uh, have to go to the hospital this week because he had a mild heart problem. Now, you know what a mild heart problem is? That's a problem that somebody else has. When you have a heart problem, it's major, amen? I mean, it's serious when it happens to you, right? And so we marshaled as many people as we could to pray for that brother, and he's doing great out of the hospital, praise the Lord. But listen, man, when you have a heart problem, that's unsettling. Or you get hit with a lawsuit, or by a foreclosure notice, or, or, or you know, somebody serves you divorce papers, and you're thinking, really? Dude, I thought we were still talking. And, and yet, there's the envelope with the papers. And you're thinking, 27 years, and now this? Or maybe you had a business partner walk off with all the money. Or have a spouse walk off with a boss. Dude, if you've ever had bad news hit you like a sledgehammer, you know what it's like to realize in just a, a second that God is your only hope. There is no human plan B to get you out of this mess. Either God shows up or dude, his light's out. And that's exactly where Hezekiah is in this story. But I want you to notice what he does next. It says in verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and he read it. And then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed. Now friends, I love this. 
Because right here, Hezekiah is training me how to pray when I face an impossible situation. He goes to the temple, he lays that letter out before the Lord, and then he prays, God, if you don't help us with this situation, dude, we are done. Now, let's drill down here and let's get trained, all right? Notice, first of all, that situation-changing prayer usually happens in a special place. Everybody say place. place. It happened in a place in this story. Now, I'm sure Hezekiah was just like you and me. He's firing off prayers all day, every day. You see something bad, you pray. You hear something bad, you pray. You fear something bad, you pray. You see something great, you pray. But man, when Hezekiah needs specific solutions to a terrible situation, he has a special place where he goes to pray. Now, he's not trying to pray his life and death situation in front of the television. He's not going to try to pray about this issue at the office with, you know, a hundred things whirling around him all the time. He's got a special place where he goes when he needs to connect with God and hear from God. And for him, it was the Jewish temple. Now, Jesus actually talked about this. <clears throat> he talked about this practice in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, man, when you pray, you need to go to your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, my buddy Alan Algram reminded me that when Jesus said that, he was talking to people who basically lived in one-room houses. I mean, they had one room, kids, animals, no walk-in closets where they could go and pray. So I think the point Jesus is trying to make and, and that Hezekiah is living out is that you need to develop a special place where you can focus your heart and your mind when you need to pray for something important and you need to an answer. And friends, can I tell you, you need to find that special place before you get hit with a horrible situation. Now, Hezekiah just does what comes natural to him. He has a special place where he goes when he needs wisdom and he needs help. And so he goes there. You need a place like that. Where is it? Think in your mind right now, where is your special place where you pray? Now, Pastor Harvey over here, he told me that he loves to pray on the second level of our lobby here at the Henderson campus. He goes to a corner over there, big glass walls all the way around. You can see almost the whole campus at the same time is inspiring for him. That's his special place. I have a prayer chair in my office that looks over a playground full of kids that we're trying to raise up in the Lord and looks out over the lake where we baptize hundreds of people. Let me tell you something, that's my prayer place. If you read the New Testament, you notice that Jesus loved to pray, but almost never in a building. He didn't go to buildings to pray. He loved nature. He went to Mount Tabor. He went to the springs of Caesarea Philippi. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Nature is apparently where Jesus felt closest to God. And dude, that's where he went when he needed to pray. But you know, here's a prayer pro tip from Jesus and from Hezekiah. Man, if you want to pray life-changing prayers, you need to find a special place where you get comfortable regularly meeting with the Lord and then meet him there. I mean, maybe it's a place where you just pull up a chair, just like this stool, and, and you just imagine that the Lord Jesus is sitting on it and you talk to him. Andy Stanley said that's what he did in a stairwell at Georgia State the whole time he went to college. I would encourage you to pick a time of day when you are at your best. If you're a morning person like me and Jesus and other godly people, Man, I would encourage you to give, you know, the Lord five minutes in prayer in the morning. And if you're a sinner and you're an evening person, no, I'm just kidding about that. But, you know, if you're sharpest in the evening, man, give God five minutes in prayer before you go to bed. That's a great place to start. Five minutes. Listen, everybody's got five minutes to read one chapter out of the Scripture and pray if you want to. And I'm telling you, a lot of this is about want to. Man, if you can't budget five minutes for the Lord a day, Bro, you got a bigger problem than poor priorities or just being a lame time manager. Listen, Hezekiah had a special place to pray. And when you have a special time and a special place when you pray, your prayers are going to go to another level. And so in this story, Hezekiah goes to his prayer place. And then he lays out this threatening letter from Sennacherib before the Lord. And here comes the next pro tip on prayer from Hezekiah. Situation changing prayers start with praise. Everybody say praise. praise. Now, friends, we talked about this a little bit last week as we unpacked the Lord's Prayer, but Hezekiah was praying this way 800 years before the Lord Jesus was born. And there is a reason he prayed this way. Watch the way his prayer begins in verse 15. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, 
O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. And the cherubim were just angels that surrounded God, throne in heaven. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth, because you, Lord, have made heaven and earth. Now, friends, look at how this situation-changing prayer begins and learn from this, because I'm telling you, it'll change the way you pray. He starts out by verbalizing the amazing greatness of his God. Now, don't miss this. Hezekiah is not just complimenting God, trying to say something nice about the Lord. Hezekiah begins his prayer in a way that reminds himself who he's talking to. He's making sure his faith tank is full before he starts asking God to change his situation. And Hezekiah is reminding himself of who his heavenly father is. And so he starts declaring it. Lord, it is my privilege to bring my situation before the Lord, the God who is enthroned on high. Lord, you're the creator. You're the king of the universe. Man, you're the one who controls everything. You've raised up every king, every kingdom, and you can put them down. You are the one with unlimited power. Man, Hezekiah is reminding himself of his identity as a son, a child of this most high God. And he's reminding himself of who he's talking to. And dude, when he does that, he is optimizing his faith. Man, he's praying to the God who is on his side. He's reminding himself, my God spoke this world into being, into being. My God put all the stars in space just right. I know my God has the power to handle some two-bit, sword-rattling Assyrian. And dude, by the time Hezekiah makes his request, he's got his head right. He's got his heart right. He is confident. He is talking to somebody who can do something about this if he chooses to do so. Now, friends, I say if because prayer is not a blank check. Can I hear amen? amen? If you've ever prayed, you already know that. Prayer is not, excuse me, it's not a blank check. There are conditions for answered prayer. And man, if you understand what those conditions are, it'll help you understand why some of your prayers are not answered. For example, number one, God's got to be your father. <laughs> if you want to expect your prayers to be answered, God's got to be your father. This is why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Man, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, God is not your father. Now, he's your creator, and he'll be your judge, and he's your Lord, and thank God he loves everybody. But friends, you only get adopted into God's family when you choose to put your faith in his son, Jesus. And if you've never given your life to Christ and you've never been baptized into him, God is not your father. And it would be a little presumptuous for you to expect him to answer your prayers when you have refused to become a part of his family. Now, the truth is, sometimes God does answer prayers for unbelievers. You know why? Because he's kind and generous and he's merciful but he certainly doesn't have any obligation to answer your prayers if you've never sought to have a relationship with him. You know, if I'm pumping gas somewhere and a dude walks up to me and says, hey man, I need some money for beer. My first thought's gonna be, step back. Second thought's gonna be, good luck with that. I don't have any beer, I don't have any beer money for you. No beer money. But if I'm sitting at that same gas station and a friend from my church walks up, or a neighbor from my neighborhood walks up and they're having car trouble and they ask him for help, dude, that's totally different. I mean, I'll get on the phone and reschedule stuff at my office. I'll get on the phone and call in all kinds of resources to help a neighbor in need because we have a relationship. I mean, you've got to know, if you have no interest in being a follower of Jesus, why would you expect him to answer your prayers? <laughs> You don't think God is like a cosmic ATM, do you? Because I think a lot of people do. And I think they think, well, that's his job, isn't it? Helping people out. Yeah, his family. In addition, though, even if you're a follower of Jesus, man, you've got to have a heart of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. That means you've got a right relationship with God and you've got a right relationship with other people. Dude, if you're praying to God to answer your prayers and you hate people of a certain color, why would you expect your prayers to be answered? <laughs> if, you, if you're praying to God and you're not walking with the Lord, you know you're not walking with the Lord. You remember when you quit walking with the Lord? 
You praying for somebody to leave their husband and shack up with you? You praying that your addiction won't get discovered and cost you your job? You're praying that your classmate will lean over so you can see the answers on her test paper and copy them? You should not even expect those prayers to be answered. Friends, the psalmist says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. I mean, it's like a rebellious kid, you know, who is asking his dad for a big favor. I mean, really? Who does that? And this is vitally important, man. Your request has got to fit into the bigger plan of God. Listen, sometimes we're praying for one thing, and God has already decided to bless you in another way that you don't know about yet. And so it feels like I'm getting a no when really there's a bigger yes on the way. Friends, God can bless a no to your prayer right now just as powerfully as he can bless a yes. And if you know him, you trust him for that. But here's a really critical condition. You gotta believe that God can and will grant that request. You gotta believe that he can and will. Friends, this is one of the most subtle and yet important conditions for answered prayer. Man, if Hezekiah had come before the Lord and said, hey God, you know, if you're out there, uh, if you're listening, uh, you wouldn't mind rescuing us from the Assyrians, would you? I just don't think much would have happened. You know, Jesus said, I, I just need to tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. Now, what does this mean? You pray like you think it's a done deal. I'm asking for something my father can answer. I'm asking for something I believe my father will answer. And I'm asking in confidence because I have a relationship with my father. I'm praying as if it's a done deal. And then Jesus says, it will be done for you. Now, now just remember, this is in Mark chapter 11. If you read Mark 11, it's a whole list of the conditions of, you know, answered prayer. And so this is, again, it's not a blank check. But what Jesus is saying is if you don't believe the answer is on the way, I mean, if you're wishing on a star or something, I mean, you don't believe the answer is on the way. It absolutely will not be. You with me on this? Man, when you pray, God may positively answer your prayer depending on a, a, a number of conditions. But if you don't believe that he can and will, he won't. Because if he answered your prayer, you'd just think it was luck. You'd say that, oh, I was just lucky. <laughs> when you were blessed. God's not wasting answers on, on that kind of stuff. Now, hopefully, if you've been around compassion for a long time, you know that God answers every prayer. Amen? Yes. Every prayer is either yes, no, wait, or grow. Right? Say it with me, everybody. Come on, big boys. Yes, no, wait, or grow. Uh, here, here it is. Bam. Uh, sorry, bad request. No. Uh, you know, great request. Timing's bad. We're going to have to work this out. Or, you know what, I'd give this to you, I'll give it to you 10 years from now when you're more mature. But he answers every prayer. Listen, every one of these is an answer to prayer. No is an answer to prayer. But listen, if you doubt that God will answer your prayer, then your faith is not full. And the, your answer is going to be no. And so, man, we see Hezekiah starting off his prayer by filling up his faith. And let me tell you, this is a pattern we see all the way through the scripture that God blesses. And man, if you've never tried this, I strongly want to encourage you to verbalize to yourself who God is as you begin praying. Man, not to compliment him so much, but to boost your faith, to remind you of who you're talking to, who this is that loves you, who this is that has promised to answer prayers for you. You boost your faith before you ask him for anything. And I'm telling you, it will change the confidence with which you pray. So let's go back to Hezekiah's prayer. His faith is focused, is full. Now look at verse 19. He says, now, O Lord, and, and just listen to the simplicity of this prayer. Deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms on earth will know that you alone are God. Now friends, situation changing prayers are strikingly simple. Say it with me, everybody. Simple. They are amazingly simple. Now, there's so much that we, you know, can learn from just this first part of his prayer. First of all, he's in his prayer place. 
He knows where to go. His letter, this threat is laid out. The enemy king is threatening to attack and destroy his city. It's imminent. And so Hezekiah tells the Lord exactly what he needs. He's not quoting poetry. He's not reading nice books to God. He said, look, this is what I need, great God. Please deliver the people that you gave me to lead from this evil king. Now, I want to encourage you to learn to trust the power of just a simple prayer. Just say, this is what I need. You know, sometimes when we pray, we haven't thought enough that we could actually just say, Lord, this is what I need. But that's what we're taught to do. The Apostle Paul taught us to do the same thing in Philippians chapter 4. This is a famous passage. Let's read it all together. Y'all ready? Here we go. Big voice like lions. Here we go. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, look at this verse. Just tell the Lord what's on your heart. Just make your request to God. And then watch what happens. What happens? Anxiety goes. When praying starts, it's almost impossible to worry about something you're praying about, which means that if you're worried today, it's because you ain't praying. Amen? So, you know, anxiety goes when praying starts. Look at this. You right-size everything. I'm bringing my request to God. He's large and in charge. He's not worried about anything. You know, you know sometimes, sometimes I'll come to God and I'll be so worried, you know, and I'm fretting and I'm, you know, sweating about this thing. And then, I'll, I mean, think about how we feel about our country today. I mean, so many of us are worried and threatened and, oh, Lord, everything's going to fall apart. God is in charge, man. And I mean, sometimes when I get in prayer and I start focusing on God, man, I start laughing that I would get so worried and so anxious at all. And then what happens? Peace comes. The peace of God. The peace you can't get anywhere else. The peace you can only get from him. Man, it begins to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, I'm telling you, when you just stop and tell your father what's on your heart, you change. You change. And then situations change because you pray. And we also need to consider the sovereignty of, of just a simple prayer. Now, you know, sovereignty means that God may choose to answer your prayer, but do it in a way that you would never have guessed. And that's what he does for Hezekiah. Now, Tony Campolo tells a story of preaching at a college one night, and eight men said, we want to pray for you before you preach, and they took him to a back room, and they asked him to kneel down so they could lay hands on him, and all eight guys put their hands on his head. Now, have you ever had that done to you before? If those guys get tired and they start leaning in, that's tough, all right? You got eight fat guys with their hand on your head, man, I'm telling you, that's tough, all right? And so, man, these guys put their hands on his head, and they just start praying. And Tony said, the more they prayed, man, the tired they got, and the more they just leaning in, and that was not a blessing, all right? But to make matters worse, one of the guys wasn't even praying for Tony. He was praying for this joker named Charlie, Charlie Stolfus. And he said, the guy went, oh, God, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in the silver trailer a mile north of the church on the right-hand side of the road. And Tony said, I wanted to grab him by the coat and say, dude, you don't need to tell God where he lives. God already knows where he lives, all right? God don't need directions from you. Oh, God, Charlie told his wife this morning he's going to leave his wife and kids. Lord, bring Charlie to the service tonight. Help him to be blessed by this message. Help this man to get through to Charlie so that he will repent and stay with his family. Bring him to this service so he can be saved, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Tony said, man, when that prayer was over, his neck was about broke. But man, he got up, he went into the church, he preached his heart out, and guess what? Charlie didn't even come to church. Charlie didn't show up. So after everybody said goodbye, he got in his car and he went back, he was driving back to Philadelphia and he, he said when he turned on the Philadelphia Turnpike, he noticed this hitchhiker and he, he loved to pick up hitchhikers and visit with them sometime. So he picks this guy up, guy gets in the car and he says, hey, my name's Tony, what's your name? He said, Charlie. My name's Charlie Stofus. And Tony couldn't believe it. He said, man, I didn't say a word. I just got off at the next exit, made a U-turn, started heading back the other direction. The guy said, dude, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? He said, I'm taking you home. He said, why? He said, because you left your wife and three kids today, didn't you? And man, that guy's eyes got like this. And he kind of plastered up against the side like this. He's watching Tony the whole time, man. Tony gets off, drives right up to the silver trailer a mile north of the church, man, on the right-hand side. The guy said, how did you know where I live? He said, God told me. And you know what? God kind of did tell him, amen? 
I mean, not the way you would think, but he did tell him. And man, when that guy walked up to the door of the trailer and opened it up, his little wife came out and started, Charlie, you're home, and started just crying and crying. And he was whispering in her ear what had happened. And Tony said he could see her eyes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he walked up and said, all right, you two, sit down. I'm talking, you're listening. We're saving this marriage tonight. And he said, man, just because of how God had worked in their lives through that whole story, they opened their heart to the Lord. He led both of them to Christ that night. They're still married today. Why? Yeah, praise the Lord. Why? Because some believer prayed a simple prayer. My friend is leaving his wife. Bring him to repentance. My friend is getting ready to make the stupidest decision of his life. Bring him to repentance. And God did. Now, friends, your prayers will not always be answered that dramatically, but you won't know if you don't pray. So, man, just pray what's on your heart and pray believing that God is a big God who's large and, and in charge and he can do stuff you can't even imagine today. Go to your special place. Start praying today. And, friends, this is so important because of the purpose of simple prayers. Now, I want to show you something in this story that you could just read right over it and miss, and it would be heartbreaking, right? Look, look at verse 19 one more time. Hezekiah says, Now, O Lord, deliver us from his hand so that, say this with me, y'all, so that all of the kingdoms on earth will know that you alone are God. Father, answer this prayer so that all the kingdoms in the world will know that you are God. Now, friends, this is a simple, bold, audacious prayer, considering the fact that Sennacherib literally has bivouacked around the city of Jerusalem with 185,000 warriors ready to attack. But man, when I saw those two words, dude, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Lord, deliver us from this evil king so that all the world will know that you alone are God. Answer this prayer so that you will be glorified. Look at what Hezekiah does not pray for. He's not saying, oh God, deliver us from this murderous king so I can keep my head and keep my job. I don't want to lose my perks. I don't want to lose Air Force One and Camp David. He's not praying that. He's not even praying, Lord, deliver us from this attacking enemy so I don't look like a failure and I have to walk around like a loser for the rest of my life. He's not even saying, Lord, deliver us from this evil king so that my wife and kids will survive, which would be a totally legit prayer. But look at how purposeful he is. Deliver us, Lord, so that your fame will spread. More people will come to know you and respect you and be curious about you and be drawn to you and ask us about you and we can share you with them and they can be saved. Lord, do this thing. Solve this problem so that all the kingdoms of earth will know that you alone are God and they can be saved. Now, friends, if you want to see your yes rate go up when you pray, I want to encourage you to shift your requests to things that honor God and bring glory to him. As you become more and more mature, this will happen. But one way to mature is to, is to just start doing this, right? You know, James, the brother of Jesus, said, when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. Why? So that you can spend the answer of your prayer on your own pleasures. Now, friends, look at me. God is not your butler. Can I get an amen? Yes. And he ain't mine either. Listen, God's chief goal is not to make you healthy, wealthy, thin, and happy. God's chief goal is to root us so deeply in Christ that, dude, we grow up to be strong women and men of faith. And man, Hezekiah is praying through that filter. Lord, deliver us from this attack so that every kingdom in the Middle East will know you alone are God. Not these idols, not these fertility cults. Only you alone are God. And friends, I'm telling you, if we'll let those two words become the filter for our prayers, I believe the quality and the power and the outcome of your prayers will dramatically change. Now, imagine what would happen if this becomes the lens through which you pray. Lord, help me at work today. Help me at work today, Lord, 
so that everybody who works here will know that a Christ follower can play at the highest level in this organization without compromising anything so that I will have influence and opportunities to lead people to Christ here at work. You know what I hear all the time? Christians say, can't pray for me to get a job at a Christian company. What? Well, so I don't have anybody talking bad about me, and I don't have to go without that stress. And I'm, me, me, wah, 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 wah. I'm like, really? You really think God wants to put you into a place where you're not going to have any influence at all? But if you were to start praying, Lord, help me to rise to the top of this organization so that I will have influence, and I will use that influence to impact people for Christ. You think God would answer that prayer? <laughs> I think he would. Absolutely. And listen, you might be surprised what would happen in your career if you stopped praying for more money and you started praying that God would position you so that you could have influence for Christ in that organization. Parents, uh, uh, what if we begin, God help me to lead my child to faith, not just so they don't go to hell, but Lord, I want them to be secure in your love so that they are unseducible by the world and they will live a life that brings you glory no matter what they do for a living. I mean, what about our church? God, you just keep pouring your favor and your power on our church so that people will just shake their heads in amazement at the love that we have for you and everybody else. And they'll be drawn to you so that someday we can introduce them to you and they can have a life-changing relationship with you. Man, if we start praying so that God will be known because of the answer of our prayers, friends, miracles might start happening. They did for Hezekiah. He's in his special place of prayer. He's praying a simple, God-honoring prayer. And then he learns that situation-changing prayer can produce power and peace. Say it with me, everybody. Big voice, come on. Power and peace. That's what we want, right? That's what we hope. Now, guess what happens when he finishes that prayer? Now, you can read it for yourself right here in chapter 19, but I'll give you the condensed version. Hezekiah says, amen, looks up, and there's the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah says, hey, I just got a word from God for you. And Hezekiah's like, well, what did he say? Uh, God said, I got this. What? What? God said, I got this. What do you think that means? And Isaiah says, well, I think it meant don't worry about Sennacherib anymore because God's got this. Now, we actually said a lot more than that, and you can read it for you yourself in chapter 19, but in verse 31, here's the executive summary. The zeal of the almighty God will accomplish this. The passionate love of the almighty God for you will answer your prayers. And it's almost like he said, Hezekiah, this is going to be one of those cases where you're not going to need to do anything, bro. You just watch my power at work in response to your prayers. And, and look at what it says in verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew, which is the way they said, run home. He got out of there. That night, God sent one angel, not a hundred angels. He didn't send a hundred thousand angels. God sent one angel into a terrorist camp and decimated that entire attacking army and neutralized that threat. And the story ends, this is a beautiful thing. It ends with a rumor that circulates through the whole Middle East. And you can read about it in 2 Chronicles 32. Here's the rumor. I mean, pagan kings all over the Middle East were talking about this. They were saying, you know, there's only really one true God in the world. I mean, we, we've got our idols in that, but there's, I think there's only one really true God, and he is crazy powerful, and he really likes Hezekiah. He likes him, and when Hezekiah prays, situations change. We better leave him alone. Don't you wish that would happen in our country? If the devil would say, there are so many great churches and there are so many godly followers of Jesus who pray with so much faith and so much power and do so much good. We better leave that country alone. Now, friends, on Monday, we're going to launch our annual 21 days of prayer. And we're going to ask every compassion Christian to pray for 21 days together. I'm going to encourage you to find a special place and set aside a daily time 
and read an assigned prayer from the book of Psalms, right? And, and we're going to all pray a simple prayer together every day. Friends, uh, you can find the schedule for our 21 days of prayer in the church app, which I hope you'll download, or at our website, or you can go to my Instagram account, TCAMHUX, uh, and you can keep up that way. In fact, you know, if you, want, if you just take a picture of the QR code on the back of your seat right now on all of our campuses, uh, it will th just take a picture of it, and it'll take you to the 21 days of prayer uh, schedule, and you'll be good to go. Now, I'm going to hit pause on my pro Psalm Proverbs challenge, you know, where we're sequentially just going through the book of Psalms. I'm going to hit pause on Friday, and on Monday, we're going to start reading 21 prayers from the book of Psalms, and then I'm going to post the, the verse that hits me, and I hope you'll do the same thing. Now, if you're going through the Psalms Proverbs Challenge with me, uh, man, you know, you can find the schedule for all of that on our website and our app, and, and I'll remind you on Instagram every day. Now, I'm going to turn the service over to our campus pastors at all of our campuses. Love you guys. God bless you. Uh, if you're on Compassion Online, how about you stick with me? Because we're going to end this service practicing what I've been preaching about. And we're going to pray for God's help.